Major funding for NJN News is provided by the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, First Fidelity Bank, PSENG, and New Jersey Bell, a Bell Atlantic company. This is NJN News with Kent Manahan, Steve Highsmith, and Jerry Henry with Sports. Good evening. Florio and Whitman toe-to-toe -to -toe tonight. On the day of their first televised debate, the gubernatorial candidates stayed home and prepared for the face-to-face -face encounter. Advisors worked with the candidates as their campaigns put out different views on what tonight means. Michael Aaron files this report. Most observers agree the onus is on Christy Whitman tonight. She's behind in the polls, including a new poll out today from the Asbury Park Press that shows Governor Florio with 47% support to 34% for Whitman. The Florio camp says tonight's debate is just a brief moment in a long campaign, but Whitman's spokesman, Carl Golden, says it's very important that Whitman show tonight that she belongs on the same stage as Florio. He says people naturally think of the governor as gubernatorial. They must think the same of Whitman tonight. So a challenger has to appear equally as gubernatorial. So to that extent, it's important, but I think it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for her as well to drive a, a message, and that is that uh, are you better off today than you were when Governor Florio took office? Are you better off economically? Uh, are you better off in your, your confidence in the future? Is your school system better? And they want to make the whole campaign, not just tonight's debate, about the past. They want to go back and revisit the past. And we want to make it about the future. And the question is, who is going to be better in the next four years for New Jersey? Someone who has had the courage to take on the NRA to ban assault weapons, or someone who wants to weaken that ban? Someone who's passed the toughest drunk driving laws in the country, or someone who wants to weaken those laws? Florio consultant Paul Begala, who helped prepare President Clinton for debates last year, says there's more pressure on Whitman than on Florio. Golden disagrees, arguing that Florio has an extra burden of trying to come across as warm and businesslike in contrast to a popular perception. That he's this hard, ambitious, driven individual who will do or say anything to get elected. Uh, he has to have a bit of a softer persona. So there's pressure on both sides. There's no question that when you're a challenger, there is more pressure. But also when you're the incumbent, you know, it's like being the Super Bowl winner. I mean, everybody's, everybody's gunning for you. And, uh, and there's a certain amount of pressure that goes with that. Golden says Florio must not appear to be verbally assaulting a woman. Begala says policies and principles will count more tonight than gender, and that Whitman has to do more than just look competent. When folks are watching it tonight, they shouldn't just say, well, is this uh, challenger, Mrs. Whitman, just capable of standing on the stage and, and not making a mistake? That's not a standard to choose a governor by. Clearly, she's going to come through the debate very smooth and slick, just like she did against Senator Bradley, just like she did in the primary. She's got to do something much more than that. She's, she's got to not, not merely stand up there and, and you know, get a bunt single. She's got to hit a home run. She's probably got to get into the upper decks. It's just going to really put her in the race. The two camps have been pretty secretive about debate preparation. We managed to learn that Florio did have a woman playing Whitman in a mock debate and that Whitman held a mock debate in a TV studio setting. The rest is shrouded in secrecy. Joining us now for a few more thoughts on the debate, Republican Roger Bodman and Democrat Jim McQueenie. Roger, despite what Carl Golden says, I think most people would say that there's more pressure on Whitman tonight. What should she do? She has to connect with the voters. I, I agree with you, absolutely. I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Paul Begala said there. The fact of the matter is, is that the, the Whitman has made herself the issue. She has got to connect with these voters. She's got to, to prove to them that, in fact, she can be the governor that she has the capacity, she has the uh, competence uh, to, to do just that, and uh, this is an opportunity for her to do it, but it, it's something that, 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 it's a must in my, view, in my view. How does that sound to you, Jim? Well, what is one debate going to do that a campaign that's lasted three years by Mrs. Whitman uh, wasn't able to do? Uh, the debate, I think, is somewhat anticlimactic. If you can't prove your case in three years, how do you prove it with a single debate? Does that mean she, that she needs a prop or a gimmick tonight to try to grab the attention of the, of the electorate? Well, the last gimmick, the tax cut, blew up. <laughs> I don't know what gimmick you would use tonight, but I, I agree with a couple of points, partially what Roger said. 
um, uh, the opponent in this case, uh, Mrs. Whitman, has to be aggressive, has to propose something. And frankly, while we're talking about being in the future, which is where everybody wants to be on this thing, partly because Mrs. Whitman doesn't want to remember the tax cut, which was in the past, or to some degree, Jim Florida doesn't want to bring up the taxes of three years ago, uh, the difficulty is, at this debate point, uh, she should be showing why she's a good alternative uh, exactly. to Florio, and it's exactly not happened to date. She, you know, she has, uh, has let Florio define her. And the fact of the matter is, and, and this whole election has been what she will do in the future, not what Florio has done in the past, not whether he's broken his promises, not whether uh, he has performed well or not well as the governor of the state over the last four years and deserves another four-year contract as, as the state's chief executive officer. Those questions haven't been asked. I think they will be tonight. And I think uh, further that she has got to prove her, her competence and, and her ability on other issues do, as well. Do you expect her to reveal more spending cuts to make her economic plan more credible tonight? Not necessarily, to be very frank with you. I think she'll talk about other issues. Uh, uh, I think she'll talk about, you know, the, the, the issues of the day, be it auto insurance, be it uh, whatever else, education, other things on her mind. It, you know, as you know, these, these questions are poised by the reporters. I think she'll respond to them. But she has to come across as being competent and confident. If they read the poll results that are out there about the tax cut, where most Republicans don't believe the credibility of, believe me, she will find something else to talk about tonight. I think maybe if she talked about more spending cuts, she'd make it more credible. Let me ask this. Is it fair to say that the Whitman campaign has to worry more about content tonight and showing a grasp of issues and that the Florio campaign has to worry more about demeanor, yes. as was suggested? Yes. In a word, in my view, just what I just said. She has to connect with the voters, Michael. She has not done that. There's, in my opinion, Florio has 40 percent or 42 percent of the vote that's really committed to him and probably 40 percent of the vote that won't vote for him under any circumstances. She's got to prove, and she's in the 30s or whatever the polls say, she's got to prove that she has the ability to be the governor. Remember and that, that, and that requires more competence, as I say, and competent and answers. The difficult thing is the late innings. Begala gave the example of a home run, but we're in the late innings. There's not a lot of undecided vote left right now. But there's it's about there's, 10 or 12 percent, so you're not arguing votes. over a lot. In, in five seconds, does Jim Florio have to worry about coming across as too rough, too harsh? A little bit, Tabiner, uh, but he'll be governor, and I think that'll uh, work out that way. Jim McQueenie, Roger Bodman, thanks very much. Back to you. Thank you, Michael. And for complete coverage of what happened in tonight's debate and how it might affect the campaign, join us at 10 this evening for a live edition of NJN News at 10. And Steve, with less than four weeks to go until the gubernatorial election, who has the most money left to spend on the campaign? Election reports released today show Christy Whitman has more money to spend than Governor Florio. To be exact, she has $1.3 million more. Both campaigns say, though, that that gap is probably not quite as large as that. The reports, which represent financial activity through this past Monday, show the incumbent governor has about $1.2 million left and Whitman with about $2.5 million. Both candidates accepted the maximum in public financing and are limited to spending $5.9 million total on their bids for office. Coming up on NJN News, New Jersey senior senator reacts to the latest developments about Somalia. And a Nobel Prize for a Princeton professor. Japan has been America's competitor. Last summer's election there produced a political upset and a new prime minister. Will the Japanese really change? How would that affect us? Find out on the season premiere of Adam Smith. Followed by informed sources at 8.30. Soon you may be driving this luxurious Lincoln Mark 8, a grand prize treasure valued at over $37,000, or traveling to Japan, Vienna, Venice, Rio, Bermuda. There are 14 trips in all, and over 120 other fabulous sweepstakes prizes all donated to benefit 13 and you. Enter by October 13th, and you could also win this dazzling Van Cleef and Arpels pendant. Need an official entry form and rules? Call or write for the treasures for 13 for you. Enter our hidden treasure sweepstakes now. President Clinton this evening says he's sending more Americans to Somalia, but also that U.S. troops will be out in about six months. The president says more troops are needed to protect those already there and to make sure that those who would harm Americans get the message that they would pay a high price. Clinton, in an address to the nation from the Oval Office, says the U.S. went into Somalia for the right reason and that the U.S. will finish the right way. Our mission from this day forward is to increase our strength, do our job, bring our soldiers out, 
and bring them home. The president's address followed by several hours of meeting he had with congressional leaders, a meeting described as contentious and animated. More troops headed for Somalia today from Georgia. Clinton says he's sending 1,700 more troops, more heavy equipment, and 3,600 Marines will be positioned offshore. All that in addition to the 650 announced earlier this week after the deadly battle in Mogadishu. That battle killed 13 U.S. servicemen. The 13th soldier died today in Germany, where he was flown in effort to save his life. Two of those killed were from New Jersey. And tonight, a memorial service is being held in Schoolies Mountain, Morris County, for one of the fallen soldiers, 21-year-old Army Specialist James Smith. And joining us now from Washington, D.C., is New Jersey Senior Senator Bill Bradley, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senator, thank you for joining us, sir. Good to be with you. What do you think of the president's decision today? Well, I don't support it. I think that uh, he provided a deadline without a framework for the kind of peace enforcement operation that he envisions. I think it even makes matters worse because it puts our more soldiers uh, on the ground and without a mission. For example, if our mission is to get General Adid, it's going to take more troops than we have there now. If our mission is stability in Somalia, it's going to take longer than next March to get stability, stability in Somalia. I think that we ought to uh, leave, and we ought to leave sooner than the president's deadline. The president today said he's sending Robert Oakley, who was, of course, an envoy for President Bush, back to Somalia. Do you think that is a smokescreen of some type, or does it have any chance of succeeding? In it's a an way. acknowledgment that this is a political problem, and it's acknowledgment that there are negotiations that have to take place. Uh, I think that the death of one soldier is a tragedy. I think that one prisoner is unacceptable. And I think and hope that Oakley will be able to negotiate their release. At the same time, we have to be clear about our role. Uh, we went over there to feed uh, starving Somalis. We've done that. Outside of Mogadishu, the plans are in operation and people are being fed. Inside Mogadishu, Mogadishu however, our mission has evolved to one of peace enforcement, a local police action. I don't think that that's uh, what uh, anyone bought on for at the beginning of this, uh, of this process. The do you mission think the, changed in March. Do you think the Congress is, on the whole, going to be uh, of your mind and some attempt will be made to change the President's decision? Force I change? think there will be efforts uh, that will probably be made to, uh, to shorten that time. I think that many people will be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think that uh, this just buys time, and I believe that the key thing is to make the decision to pull out because the mission itself was, uh, was ill-defined and uh, poorly, poorly uh, uh, planned and was open-ended from the beginning. The problem was that we allowed one ad hoc decision after another ad hoc decision to get us into this fix where our troops are in harm's way without uh, a mission clearly defined. On September 9th, the commander of forces in Somalia asked for more M1A1 tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles and more support in general. That was denied. There may have been another request. There are some who say that Les Aspen, who's taking the heat for that now, ought to resign for not supporting and, and in essence, doing what they're doing now. Do you agree with that? No, well, I don't agree with that. I think that one of the problems uh, when you're running an operation under UN auspices is it's a multilateral operation. I mean, there are uh, Pakistanis, there are Malaysians, there are other nationalities that are part of the military force that's uh, in Somalia. Um, uh, and yet, you wouldn't know that. Uh, anytime the United States gets involved with this number of troops, it becomes uh, an American mission to the world. That isn't, in fact, what it is. The operation itself required planning. That planning was faulty. Uh, and the result was that it didn't function as well as it could have. Uh, I think we have to look at this also in terms of the future. I mean, there could be humanitarian missions that we might want to take in the future. If so, we ought to learn from this and define clearly how we will define success and before we go in and when the end will occur before we go in. Senator Bradley, thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank Senator you. Senator Bill Bradley. An update on another world crisis. A New Jersey woman who was injured in unrest in Russia earlier this week is now in a hospital in Finland. Co-workers at a law firm in Moscow where 23-year-old Julie Brooks works says she remains in critical condition. Brooks was shot in the back by sniper fire during the turmoil near the Russian parliament. She was one of six Americans wounded during the uprising Sunday and Monday. Brooks attended Cornell University in New York and majored in Russian studies. 
A Princeton professor has reached new heights in her career. American author Toni Morrison was awarded the 1993 Nobel Prize in Literature today. As Rich Young reports, the award goes to a woman who comes from a humble background and uses language to bring the perspective of the African-American world to life. Overwhelmed is a pretty good word. 62-year-old <laughs> Toni Morrison has reason to be overwhelmed today. The Princeton Humanities professor was awarded the 1993 Nobel Prize in Literature. Yes. Morrison started her professional writing career in 1970 and has since produced several well-known novels and essays. She's known for writing about the American black experience, reminiscent of her own upbringing. Today, the Swedish Academy recognized her for her work in giving African Americans a voice in literature. It's very difficult to shed the straitjacket that racism imposes on language. It's hard to not be imprisoned by it. So breaking out of that and being able to actually say it from one's own point of view, is extremely important. Morrison was called at home this morning by a Princeton provost and told she had won the prize. At first, she did not believe it, but after several additional congratulatory calls, the good news started to sink in. I was so disbelieving. I kept saying, Ruth, you mean I was nominated? And she said, so she told me later she spent the morning waking everybody up because I had almost persuaded her that she had hallucinated it. Morrison's first book is called The Bluest Eye. It's a tale about a young black girl who dreamed of having blonde hair and blue eyes, for she thought that having those characteristics would get her noticed. In the book it did, by her father, who raped her, she then bore his child. The book is described as being bold and beautiful, and it set the stage for a number of renowned literary works. Morrison says she finds her prize especially important in that her aging mother can share in her glory, she said her mother worked as a restroom attendant to pay her way through college, and now, nearly 40 years later, she can see her work come to life. <laughs> Word of Morrison's award spread quickly on the Princeton campus today, where many students said the prize is well-deserved. She's unbelievably prolific. She um, not only has contributed here, but has contributed around the world. She is just a very warm woman, very um, dedicated to education and to um, Piece as well. The Nobel Prize includes a cash award of $825,000. Morrison says she'll first pay off her mortgage and then do something creative with the money. Rich Young, NJN News, Princeton. The state medical board will no longer be permitted to ask doctors whether they've had psychiatric or drug abuse treatment. Physicians were asked those questions on the 1993 licensed physician renewal form. But a federal judge in Newark today ruled that those questions are not valid. The state's medical society had argued that the questions violate the Americans with Disabilities Act. Judge William Bassler agreed and is giving the state medical board 30 days to meet with the medical society to resolve the issue. But the judge maintains the board can ask doctors for employment histories and for patient complaints. Disturbing, unsettling testimony today at the World Trade Center bombing trial about victims killed in the blast. And on the stand were those who also helped save lives. Ms. Trisha Gaspris reports. In every disaster, there are heroes. Sometimes they're the people who have been trained for such emergencies, and sometimes they're just ordinary citizens responding in an extraordinary way. Like Fred Furby, a refrigeration mechanic who worked in the World Trade Center. Furby was on the B-2 level of the underground garage, not too far from where the explosion happened. Quote, it was so powerful, I was blown across the room. It was dark. I was screaming. I heard somebody screaming. After he dug himself out of the rubble which buried him, he went to help those who were severely injured. They were fellow workers trapped by fallen lockers and debris in their maintenance room. They were unable to walk, so Furby carried them. I had one over my shoulder and the other under my arm. Furby carried them through the pitch black interior of the garage, climbing over debris he said that was taller than he was. Finally, he reached a level where there was a small coffee shop. I took carts from the Coffee Express and put one guy on one cart and one guy on the other. When Furby finally pushed the two outside to safety and flagged down an ambulance, he went back in the building and back down to the B2 level to see if there were other people trapped. Another hero on that day was Port Authority Police Officer Thomas McHale. He was in the underground path station during the explosion. After helping evacuate people there, he spent the next 15 hours tending to those who were stranded and injured. 
and then he spent the next 11 days in the hospital in intensive care, suffering from pneumonia, smoke inhalation, and toxic poisoning. Until now, the prosecution had stayed away from any graphic testimony concerning those who had been killed in the blast. But today, the jury was shown very graphic pictures of those who had died in the explosion, including the picture of a pregnant woman. One rescue officer also testified what it was like searching for a body which had been missing for two weeks in rubble. Port Authority police officer Stephen Vital found the victim, Wilfredo Mercado. I found a shoe. The shoe had a foot. And after further digging, I found a leg. There is no testimony on Fridays during this trial, and Monday is a federal holiday, so the court is closed. Testimony will resume on Tuesday. Trish DeGasparis, NJN News at the Federal Courthouse in Manhattan. When we come back, Dave Barber will check the forecast. In sports, the Phillies draw first blood. Gary Henry has a story. From high in the Andes, we've got a wild and woolly tail feel about a treasure worth its weight in gold. And that's nothing to spit at. <laughs> Discover the golden fleece of the llama, alpaca, guanaco, and vicuña, the treasure of the Andes, next time on Nature. Sunday at 8. It's tremendously frustrating for people who live here. New Jersey has historically been ill-served by the New York media, but 13 is an exception. The station has committed money and airtime to issues that really affect New Jersey communities, whether it's taxation or health care, the arts or education. These complex issues can't be tossed off to a two-minute news story. With reliable funding, 13 can make a long-term investment in New Jersey's future. What a Phillies finish last night, Jerry. You got that right. Whoa. All tense, but hey, exciting. The Phillies okay. and Braves are set for game two tonight at Veterans Stadium, Philadelphia, with a dramatic win last night in the 10th inning. And it was set up by the pitching of Kurt Schilling, a choice that many wondered about as the game one starter. But Schilling went on to prove his doubters wrong, setting an NLCS record by striking out the first five batters. Schilling worked eight innings, fanning all the Braves' big guns, Blouser, Gant, McGriff, and Justice. And the Phillies would go to the fifth down a run. That's when Pete Incavilia would tie the game with his fifth homer of the season over the wall at center. And they go on to the 10th tied at three when Kim Batiste redeems himself. More about that later. He drives in the winning run. And just like that, the Phillies jump ahead of the favorite phrase, winning 4-3 and take a one-game lead. Well, I definitely think it's important to get on, off to uh, the right foot. Uh, they are an outstanding ball club. Uh, we also are a, an outstanding ball club, man. It was good to win the first one and get that under our belt. It's, it's good to win the first one. You know, that's, that's, I heard Paul Molitor say that last night, so I figured, what the hell, I'll use it too. <laughs> Kim Batiste was a game hero, but only after a costly throwing error in the ninth inning that led to an Atlanta run to tie the game. Batiste from game goat to hero. I think I've had a chance, you know, I, I, I was I was hoping I got a chance to redeem myself, and I did, so, you know, I was really thinking about it hard. He's had some big hits for us, he made some great plays for us, so, you know, he had to be a little nervous. I mean, we were all nervous to start the game. You know, you can imagine what he's like coming in the ninth inning. Well, it's one of the toughest jobs uh, in the game to go in for defense because it's really a thing that uh, the only thing you can really do is screw up. But it turned out to be a happy ending for the home team as they could go home and relax with game one neatly tucked away. Go home and, and uh, not sleep again because we got Maddox tomorrow. <laughs> you know, you go from right from the, to, from the frying pan into the fire. Avery Maddox and, you know, then you get a breather with Glavin and Smoltz. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no, nothing's easy with these guys. As he said, in game two, it's, it's the Rays' Greg Maddox against Tommy Green, who is 16-4 on the season, 1-0 against the Braves. Now it's his turn against the Braves' big guns. I just try to go out at everybody at the same, you know, trying to make them hit my pitch. I'm not going to give in to them. I mean, uh, uh, I mean I'm not going to try to give in to them. I mean, you make bad pitches here and there, but uh, I'm just going out there to concentrate on making my pitches and, uh, and making them swing the bat. You know, you can't look at it that way. Anybody going to hurt you because everybody on that team can hurt you over there. Are you comfortable pitching games two and six? No, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, as long as we win. It 
In hockey, the Devils opened their season with a win over Tampa Bay last night at the Meadowlands. New Jersey gets ready for the Capitals tomorrow night. And former Seton Hall guard Terry DeHare is now signed with the Clippers. Signed today, terms of the contract were not released. That's right. You know, you got to like John Crook, but he always acts like something's crawling on him. Have you noticed it is. that? It's kind of a, a Bobcat Goldthwait uh, type thing. Uh, always funny, though. Yeah, it's just always. naturally funny. <laughs> naturally funny. Well, ball, you know, here's our guy, Dave Barber, with the forecast. Dave? <laughs> Well, Steve here looking at our satellite picture. Plenty of moisture just to the south of us. Big area of low pressure off the Carolina coastline, keeping things active down there. But still, a high-pressure ridge holding on for our area. So the clouds having a tough time moving into New Jersey this evening. High pressure again still holding on. There's the area of low pressure well to the south. Plenty of rain, windy conditions down there. For us, though, frontal system just to the north. The separating line between the clear weather for us and the wetter weather. Yes, there is a little bit of precipitation across far northern sections of New England. Plenty of weather, even wintry weather, across portions of the Rockies and Plains tomorrow. For us, still fairly quiet. Moisture with this area of low pressure, though, working its way northward will keep our eye on that. First, for the rest of tonight, generally fair skies. A few more clouds increasing late tonight. Overnight low temperatures, middle upper 40s northwest, generally 50s elsewhere. For tomorrow, clouds will be on the increase. We'll see temperatures generally in the 70s. Our four-day forecast in a few minutes. Thank you, Dave. For Channel 13 viewers, that's our news for tonight. I'm Steve Heisman. And I'm Kent Banahan. From all of us here at NJN News, thank you for being with us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.